right, look with me in Malachi chapter 3. Going to start reading in verse 6. Let's talk about tithing this morning. Malachi 3 and beginning in verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Do you know that's what the Lord wants for us? The Lord wants us to live lives that are blessed by him in every possible way, in every possible facet of the meaning of that word blessing. God wants us to live blessed lives so that we provoke holy jealousy in people, so that they look at us and they say, I don't know what he's got, but I want some. I don't know what she's got, but I want some. God wants to make us a delightful land. He wants to make us joyful, healthy, at peace, thriving in every possible way so that others will come and say, I want what he's got. I want what she's got. Let's talk about tithing this morning. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you for your beautiful people. Thank you for your presence with us today. Thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Lord, I pray that you'd give us listening ears. I pray that you'd give us perceptive hearts, Lord. I pray that you'd give us the ability to receive your word. And Lord, I pray we would encounter you while your word is being ministered. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. One rainy Saturday afternoon when our kids were just babies, there was a knock on our door. I answered and there was a teenage boy standing there shivering in the rain. He was probably 17 or 18 years old and he launched into a script. At that time, a high capacity electrical cable was being run across the floor of the Long Island Sound from New Haven over to Long Island and environmental groups were protesting it. They were trying to stop the work because they were concerned about the impact on the sound. The kid at my door was nervous. He was holding his script to his nose. He was shaky. And something happened in my heart as I stood there watching him. I thought, you know, this kid believes so strongly in his cause that he's willing to spend his Saturday afternoon. He's, he's willing to go out in the rain and go door to door and ask perfect strangers to join him in his cause. When he finished, I said to him, you know, I just want to tell you that I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you for believing so strongly in your cause that you're willing to come out here today and talk to strangers about it. Well done. After we talked, I shut the door and I prayed, Lord, forgive me. Here was a young man who was willing to speak up for what he believed was a good cause. But I believe that our cause is the best cause that ever was. Beloved, there are many good causes out there, but our cause is peace with God. That brings peace within and peace with others. Our cause is inner freedom. Our cause is inner healing and wholeness. Our cause is salt and light in a dark and a decaying world. Our cause is hope. Our cause is eternal life. The eternal destinies 
of our family and friends and neighbors and millions of souls. Our cause is the cause of all causes. And if a teenage boy wasn't ashamed to raise funds for a good cause, I determined in my heart that day never to be ashamed to raise funds for God's cause. Beloved, I, I will tell you that we urgently need your help right now to finish phase two. And I'm not ashamed to ask you to give sacrificially towards it because I believe with my whole heart that this cause is the best cause that ever was. I'm not ashamed to ask you to give sacrificially to missions because our cause is the best cause that ever was. I'm not ashamed to ask you to tithe to Harvest Time Church because our cause is the best cause that ever was. I want to take a few minutes this morning to talk to you about tithing. Some of us are under-informed about tithing. We've never really been taught clearly from the Bible what is tithing. The word tithe actually means a tenth. It means 10%. Why should we tithe? Where should we tithe? How often should we tithe? Some of us are misinformed about tithing. We've been told that it doesn't apply to us as New Testament believers. I, I want to speak to that a little bit this morning, if I may. Some of us are well-informed, but we're out of practice. My friend Jackson Sinyanga says, America, you are educated beyond the level of your obedience. And it's true. So let's talk about tithing this morning. There are three truths that I want to share with you, especially today, about tithing. Three truths. First of all, God measures our worship in giving. God measures how we worship him in our giving. There's a basic truth running through the Bible that we should all agree on today. Giving is an integral part of our worship to God. We worship God with the praises of our mouth. We worship him with the consecration of our lives, our bodies. And we worship him with the giving of our resources. Whatever you may or may not believe about tithing, if you know the Bible at all, then you know that giving is part of worship from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Giving as worship begins in Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel. Giving as worship takes a very specific pattern in the time of the patriarchs beginning with Abraham. Giving as worship was codified in the law of Moses. Giving as worship was taught by Jesus according to a standard that exceeds the standard of the law. Giving as worship was taught by the apostles and practiced by the New Testament church according to a standard that exceeded the law. The book of Revelation tells us that even in heaven, giving will eternally be part of our worship of God. What else would we do with treasure in heaven but lavish it on the feet of Jesus and heap more honor on him? Did you know that giving is mentioned 921 times in the Bible? Faith is only mentioned 270 times. Hope is mentioned 165 times. Love, 485 times. That means that giving is mentioned more than faith, hope, and love combined. And now abideth these three, faith, hope, and love. But greater than the sum of these is giving. <laughs> giving is mentioned seven times more often than prayer. Eight times more often than belief. Giving is mentioned in 17 out of 38 of Jesus' parables. Is there any believer here who disagrees that giving is part of our worship? Oh, nobody. See, that's good. We're 100% agreed. <laughs> now here's a complimentary truth. God measures our worship in giving. In both Testaments of the Bible, we read that God inspects how we give. See, giving to the Lord is unlike any other kind of giving on earth. It's unlike any kind of compassion giving. It's unlike any other kind of philanthropy or patronage of humanities or the arts. Giving to the Lord is a spiritual act of worship with spiritual outcomes. 
any other kind of giving you do comes from the largesse of your heart. And whatever you do is wonderful, but giving to the Lord is different. God inspects the quality and the quantity of what we offer him. And he measures our worshipful heart by it. We see that truth in the very beginning. Adam and Eve gave birth to two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was a farmer and he brought an offering of some fruits, the Bible says. Abel was a herdsman and he brought an offering of the fat portions of the firstborn of his flock. You see, Genesis is hinting at a qualitative difference in their offerings, some fruits or fat portions from the firstborn of the flock. God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's offering. Genesis doesn't say explicitly why God rejected Cain's offering, but it's clear from what follows that there was a heart problem that was already brewing. The New Testament sheds more light on it. Hebrews says that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain because his offering was an expression of his pure faith. John says that Abel's offering was righteous, but Cain's was not. Throughout the Old Testament, again and again, we find God measuring the worshipful hearts of his people by the quantity and the quality of their offerings. In Haggai, God indicts his people because they neglected his house but beautified theirs. In Malachi, God indicts his people because they offered him their blind and injured and diseased animals. In other words, they offered him their leftovers rather than bringing him their best. God says, try offering that to your governor. See if he'll be pleased with you. In Malachi 3, God says his people have robbed him by bringing only a portion of the tithe rather than the whole tithe. God says, I'm your father, but you don't honor me. I'm your master, but you don't show me respect. I am the Lord Almighty, but you show contempt for my name. In the New Testament, Jesus measured people's worshipful hearts by the quantity and the quality of their offerings. When a woman lavished her bottle of precious perfume on him, he said she loves much because she's been forgiven much. One day Jesus sat against the temple treasury. That means he sat like a judge weighing the giving of the people. An old widow came along and she threw in two tiny copper coins. I happen to have two coins that are exactly like the ones that she threw in. They were given to me years ago by a coin collector. They're teeny tiny, smaller than a shirt button. And Jesus said, there, that is the offering that I've been waiting for. All the others gave something out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, gave all that she had. Paul also taught that God measures our worshipful hearts by the quantity and quality of what we offer him. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable to the Lord according to what one has. Beloved, any other kind of giving, whatever you do, it is wonderful, but not so with your giving with the Lord. Jesus still sits against the temple treasury and he still weighs our giving. That's tight, but it's right. I want you to know as your pastor, I don't know what anybody gives to Harvest Time Church ever. Pastor Tate before me didn't. My home pastor that I grew up under in Philadelphia, my father and the Lord, he never knew what anybody gave to our church. It's the way I was mentored for ministry. When we were building this building, a handful of people brought me checks some were $30,000, some were $50,000. Somebody gave $25,000 to put that window in. I, I know who it is. Someone gave $15,000 to buy the piano. I, I know who that was. This poor old piano. Pray for our piano. After 14 years in a Pentecostal church, its strings are played out. So we, we have to get the piano tuned every week now for about $200 each, each tuning. So before we move into the new building, we either have to refurbish this piano or we have to get a new one. But in 21 years, those are the only gifts that I've ever known about. 
In 2008, someone gave a $750,000 gift. And I don't know who it was. And if it was you, thank you, thank you, thank you. As far as I'm concerned, I'm absolutely overwhelmed every week by the faithfulness of our congregation. Truly, I, I am. Week after week, I'm, I'm literally blown away by how faithful and generous God's people are. But as far as Jesus is concerned, beloved, I want you to know that he still sits against the temple treasury. He still weighs our worshipful hearts by the quantity and the quality of what we bring him. What have we brought him in proportion to what he has given us and with what kind of attitude have we brought it? About tithing, three truths. Number one, God measures our worship in giving. Number two, God has set a standard measure for our giving, which is the tithe. God has set a standard measure for our giving, which is the tithe. In the Bible, tithing begins in Genesis 14 with Abraham. There was a king called Ketiolamer who got together a coalition army and he ransacked Sodom and Gomorrah, took away all the people, took away all the wealth, all the plunder, and he carried away Abraham's nephew, Lot. Abraham got together 318 men from his own house and he went after that coalition army and he defeated them. He recovered a lot. He recovered all the wealth that was taken. And when he returned, he gave a tenth of everything to Melchizedek, God's priest. The tithe was an offering of thanksgiving to God. It was an acknowledgement that it was God who enabled Abraham to defeat those four kings with just 318 men. And that's what the tithe still is today. It is a thank offering to God. It is an acknowledgement that everything we have has come from God. All of our abilities, all of our success has come from God. The next occurrence of the tithe is in Genesis 28. Jacob is running for his life from his brother. And in a place called Bethel, he has an encounter with God. And in response to the encounter, Jacob makes a vow. I love this prayer. It's beautiful. In Genesis 28, it's a good one to memorize. Jacob's vow. He says, God, if you will be with me, if you will watch over me on this journey I'm taking, if you'll give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then you will be my God. And listen, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Jacob realized that it is God who gives us all that we have. Now, where did he learn that? Where, where did he learn to give a tenth back to God? Well, he learned it from his father, Isaac, who learned it from his father, Abraham. Fast forward to Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, and we find the principle of tithing codified into the law of Moses. God gives two main purposes for the tithe. The first is that so his people will reverence him. Deuteronomy 14 verse 22. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Your grain, your new wine, olive oil, the firstborn of all your herds and flocks. Here's the purpose. So that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But I would listen to me. When you tithe, there is an earthly response. God, God pours out earthly blessings on you. There is a, a, a response of God's provision. But when you tithe, there is a spiritual outcome as well. Tithing keeps your pride in check. It produces humility in your heart. It is a perpetual reminder to you and me that we're not all that in a bag of chips. We belong to God and everything we have belongs to God. Can I tell you something? Living here in Greenwich, I'm not from Greenwich. I'm just a kid from Philly who likes soft pretzels with mustard on them. I'm not from this place. But living here for 21 years, can I tell you, in Westchester County, in Fairfield County, with all the success and all the wealth, it's very easy to get caught up in the whole pride thing. You ride around in your little convertible Volkswagen. 
and you think, boy, I'm something. <laughs> I have a little convertible VW bug. I call it my baby Porsche. I feel pretty good till I pull up next to a guy with a real Porsche. <laughs> but it's so easy to get caught up in the whole pride of things and, and to think, boy, I, I, really, I really made something of myself. I've really, I really done well. I'm living the big life. I'm a, and let me tell you something. Tithing is God's way of keeping the pride in check in our heart. It's his way of reminding us that it has all come from him and that it all belongs to him. Beloved, can I tell you what you have is not yours. It is simply loaned to you by God to manage. When my daughter Maddie was still a baby, we used to play a little game in her high chair. I'd pour some Cheerios out onto her tray table and then I'd ask her to share one with me. And she would hold up a Cheerio, and just as I was about to chomp it, she would pull it away and say, mine, and pop it in her mouth and laugh her head off. We could do that game all day long. I'd ask her, will you share a Cheerio with Daddy? And she'd hold up the Cheerio, and just before I chomped it, mine, and she'd laugh and laugh. What Maddie didn't realize was that all the Cheerios were there because of me. I'm the guy who went to work and earned the money to buy the Cheerios. And because we had two preemie twins, I went to the store and I bought the box of Cheerios and I brought it home. And I went to the cabinet and I got the Cheerios and I poured some on her tray. Maddie also didn't realize that I had a whole lot more Cheerios where those came from. I had a big box on the counter. I had three or four big boxes in the cupboard. If I wanted to, I could put a mountain of Cheerios on her tray. I could go to the store and buy dozens of boxes. I could put her in the bathtub. I could fill it with Cheerios. <laughs> but here she was holding on to her one little Cheerio. It's mine. Can I tell you, we get like that with God sometimes. Yeah. Beloved, all the Cheerios on your tray came from him. I know you work hard. I do too. But he's the one who gave you that capacity. He's the one who gave you that opportunity. You ought to be thankful to God. You have breath in your lungs. You have the light of human consciousness and conscience. Thank God that you're alive and you're able. In him we live and move and have our being. And he has a lot more Cheerios where the, than the ones that are on our tray. He has the ability to overwhelm us with Cheerios. But when he asks for just one, we hold on to it tightly and we say, it's mine. The second purpose God gives for tithing is practical. It's the way that his ministry on earth is supported. In the end of Deuteronomy 14, God says that the tithe is the way that his ministers are supported. It's the way that God's people create a fund corporately so that they can give help to refugees and orphans and widows. And in verse 29 of Deuteronomy 14, God says, if you do that, if you bring the tithe, if you support my ministers, if you give compassionately, then I will bless all the work of your hands. Amen. Leviticus chapter 27 and Numbers chapter 18 say the same thing. Numbers 18 verse 20. I have given all the tithe in Israel to the Levites for an inheritance in return for their service which they perform in the tent of meeting. We said there's a basic truth that runs through the Bible. Giving is an integral part of our worship. There's a second basic truth that runs all the way through the Bible. Giving is God's designated means for supporting his ministry and his ministers. Amen. Beloved, whatever you might believe about tithing, if you know the Bible, this is true. Paul applied the Old Testament model to the New Testament ministry. He wrote to the Corinthians, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food in the temple? Those who serve at the altar get their food from the altar. Listen to Paul's words in the same way. The Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. 
In other words, Paul is saying in precisely the same way that God intended in the Old Testament for the giving of his people to fund the work of the ministry, it's a new covenant, but the model hasn't changed. In the new covenant, God has still intended that the giving of his people fund the work of his ministry. That's good preaching right there. He wrote to the Romans, how shall they believe unless they hear? And how shall they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Actually, John Piper points out that the financial needs of New Testament ministry are greater than the needs of Old Testament ministry. Old Testament ministry was stationary. They stayed in one place, but New Testament ministry is missionary. Jesus told us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and preach to everything that lives and breathes and moves, and that requires funding. Is there any believer here who disagrees that giving is the way that God supports the work of the ministry? Good. See, we're once again 100% in agreement. We agree on two things. Giving is integral part of our worship, and giving is the way God supports the ministry. That only leaves one question, then, how much should we give? I would propose to you that God's standard for giving is the tithe. That's the basic starting place for our giving, and it goes up from there. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus condemns what he calls the righteousness of the Pharisees. The righteousness of the Pharisees is the little maneuvers they had to get out of honoring the law. It's the little loopholes that they created. They tried to figure out ways to to keep the letter of the law without really truly honoring the spirit of the law. Jesus came along and he said the true righteousness of the kingdom is righteousness that always goes the second mile. It instinctively does more than the law requires. He said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes when I hear believers talking about why they don't tithe, it sounds a whole lot to me like the righteousness of the Pharisees. Let me debunk two excuses for not tithing. Excuse number one, tithing is not in the New Testament. It is absolutely untrue that tithing is not in the New Testament. Tithing actually appears in four different texts, and most important is what came from the mouth of Jesus. In Matthew 23, 23, and in Luke eleven forty two, 42, Jesus affirmed the practice of tithing. He was confronting the Pharisees about their phony righteousness. He said, you tithe on your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Listen to what Jesus said. Listen to the words of Yeshua, Jesus, our master, our Lord, the one that we follow. He says, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Jesus affirmed the practice of tithing, but he also taught that the act of tithing alone isn't enough. It has to be a join, joined with a heart that is full of living faith and love for God. It is true that absolutely nowhere in the New Testament does Jesus or Paul or John or anyone else say we must tithe. It only says we should give. Jesus said, when you give, give like this. Don't let anyone see what you're doing. Paul said, when you give, give like this. On the first day of the week, that's Sunday, bring your offering in proportion to what God has given you with a cheerful heart. But how much should we give? Well, Jesus and Paul and John were all Jewish. The standard they would have been familiar with would have been the tithe. Two quick thoughts here. First of all, tithing is not not in the New Testament. It's terrible grammar, but it's good preaching. (laughs) Tithing is not, not in the New Testament. Let me explain. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say we must tithe, but nowhere does it say not to tithe. There are many places in the New Testament where requirements of the law are reversed, are negated, but not tithing. Jesus affirmed tithing, but nowhere is tithing negated. You might be interested to know that nowhere in the New Testament are musical instruments mentioned in conjunction with worship. 
Because of that, some of our Mennonite friends have concluded that God must not want us to use instruments in our worship, even though the Old Testament is full of instruments. So if you go to many Mennonite churches this Sunday morning, you'll hear them singing in beautiful a cappella harmony. You know, that's fine for them, but I sure am thankful for our instruments on Sunday morning. However, ironically, those same Mennonites do tithe. Tithing is not not in the New Testament. It doesn't say not to tithe. A second quick thought, in the absence of tithing as a standard, the only other standard for giving in the New Testament appears to be all. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, give to everyone who asks of you. Jesus put no qualifications. He put no parameters. He put no limitations on that. He said, if someone takes, wants to take your shirt, give them your coat too. Jesus sat against the temple treasury and the only giving he commended was from the one woman who gave all that she had. He told the rich young ruler, give away all that you have and come follow me. Jesus commended the woman who poured out all of her precious perfume on him. He said she has done all all that she could. Jesus talked about giving up houses and lands for his sake. In Luke 14, he said, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. In the absence of the standard of tithing, the only other standard I find is all. Shall we talk about the giving of the early church? Acts 2, 44. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Acts 4.32, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. There was no needy person among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. Shall we talk about Paul? He wrote, for his sake, I have lost all things that I might gain Christ. In the absence of tithing as a standard, the only other standard I find is all. And maybe that's why the New Testament doesn't say anything about tithing. Maybe it's because what God is looking for is not pharisaical hearts that keep the letter of the law with such precision, but he's looking for hearts that overflow and abound with generosity because that's what his heart is like. God so loved that he gave the best that he had. You know what's funny? I have never yet met a believer who disagrees with tithing and gives more than 10%. I've never yet met a believer who disagrees with tithing and gives 20 or 30 or 40%. Maybe that person's out there. I've never met them in 40 years in the church. But I have known believers who agree with tithing and have grown in their giving from 10% to 20 to 30 I've known people who have grown all the way up to 90%. They do what they call reverse tithing. This is true. I have known people, they live on 10% and they give away 90% to the Lord. People who don't tithe seldom give more than the tithe, but people who do tithe seldom give only the tithe. They usually give much more. Excuse number one, tithing is not in the New Testament. And excuse number two, tithing was part of the law, and we're not under law, we're under grace. Psh, you can do better than that. <laughs> it's absolutely true that tithing was codified under the law of Moses, but beloved, listen to me, tithing preceded the law. Tithing began with Abraham, the man of faith, and the father of all who lived by faith. Tithing began with the man who was saved by grace before he was ever circumcised. Tithing was codified in the law, but it preceded the law. And I submit to you that the principle of tithing extends beyond the law. Honoring our parents was codified in the law, but it was right to do before the law, and it's right to do after the law. Thou shalt not kill was codified in the law, but it was given as a command by God before the law. And thank you, Jesus, it still extends beyond the law. 
simply because something was codified in the law doesn't mean that it was negated by the cross unless the New Testament tells us so. About tithing, three truths. God measures our worship in giving. God has set a standard measure for our giving, the tithe. And finally, God wants us to measure our giving generously. Jesus, Yeshua, our Master, our Lord, said give. That's an imperative. It's a command. Give, and it shall be given back to you. Jesus said, for with the same measure you use, God will measure back to you. Giving is mentioned 921 times in the Bible. There are 2,350 verses in the Bible that deal with how we manage our money and the resources that God has entrusted to us. God wants us to make as much as we can. He wants us to manage it well. And he wants us to give as much as we can. If I might ask a pointed question today, when you do your financial planning, is giving included in your plans? Is giving in your budget? Do you and your spouse sit down and discuss what you're going to give and agree upon it together? Do you know at the start of each year how much you plan to give? You made a pledge to phase two. Did you budget how you were going to give towards it? Do you know each month? Do you know each week what you plan to give? Beloved, listen to me. If you didn't decide how much you were going to give before you came to church this morning, you probably didn't give as much as you should have. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, on the first day of the week, each of you should bring an offering as you determine, as you have planned out, as you have figured it, as you have honored the Lord by budgeting Him into your weekly budget, bring an offering as you determine in proportion to how God has blessed you. Paul says, plan to give and give well. Cain brought some fruits from the soil, but Abel brought the fat portion of the firstborn of his flock. A follow-up question. First question, when you do your financial planning is giving included in your plans. A follow-up question, do you have long-term goals with regard to giving? Have you set a goal to give more this year to the Lord than you gave last year? Have you set a goal to give more next year than you're giving this year? Have you set a goal to grow in your giving from 10% to 20% or beyond that? Have you thought about designating giving in your will? I had a friend who met the Lord in the late 1960s. As a new believer, he heard a missionary speak and God put something in his heart. He set a goal to give $1 million dollars to missions. Now, this is above and beyond his weekly tithe to his church. It took him from the late 1960s to the end of the 1990s, but he finally gave his million dollars to missions. And guess what? The week after he completed that pledge, he started working on his second million. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, just as you excel in every gift, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in earnestness, in love, see that you also excel in this grace gift of giving. John Piper recounts the story of John Wesley, who is the father of Methodism and the grandfather of Pentecostalism. And I want to close with John Wesley today. Piper writes, John Wesley was one of the great evangelists of the 18th century, born in 1703. In 1731, he began to limit his expenses so that he would have more money to give. In the first year, his income was 30 pounds, and he found he could live on 28 pounds, so he gave two away. In the second year, his income doubled, but he held his expenses flat, and so he had 32 pounds to give away a comfortable year's salary. In the third year, his income jumped to 90 pounds, and he gave away 62 pounds. In his long life, Wesley's income advanced to as high as 1,400 pounds in a year, but he rarely let his expenses rise above 30 pounds. 
He said that seldom he had more than 100 pounds in his possession at a time. This so baffled the English tax commissioners that they investigated him in 1776. They insisted that for a man of his income, he must have more silver than he was paying excise tax on. He wrote to the commission, I have two silver spoons in London and I have two silver spoons in Bristol. This is all the silver I own and I shall not buy any more while so many around me need bread. When he died in 1791 at the age of 87, the only money mentioned in his will were the coins found in his pocket. Most of the 30,000 pounds he earned in his life had already been given away. He wrote, I can't help but leaving my books behind me when God calls me forward, but in every other respect, my own hands have been the executors of my estate. In other words, he gave it all the way. Wesley's motto was this. Beloved, look at me. Everybody look at me. Wesley's motto was this. Earn all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. May that be our motto too. Earn all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can to honor the Lord and to bless his world. About tithing, three truths. God measures our worship and giving. He set a standard measure for giving the tithe, and he wants us to measure our giving generously. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise?